So hello everybody and welcome to this Constitution Unit webinar on the Brexit Freedoms Bill. Uh, I'm Joe Tomlinson from the University of York and I have the pleasure of chairing this session. As the attendees at this seminar are likely to be aware, the Brexit Freedoms Bill was announced as part of the Queen's speech. We're still waiting for the bill itself and given recent political developments, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer before we see it. However, we do know what the broad intention of the bill will be. The government's central aim is to make retained EU law, that is, former EU legislation on the British statute book during placed on the British statute book during the Brexit process, easier to amend. The ongoing Conservative leadership contest has provided no evidence that this aim is going to be displaced. If anything, the debate has leaned towards the idea that this process should be accelerated. Politically, the, Bre the Brexit Freedoms Bill is being presented as, quote, a major cross-government drive to cut one billion of red tape for businesses and improve regulation. However, it's important to remember that this very same body of law affects the everyday lives of citizens, and this is an enormous reform project that will cut across many important policy areas. Constitutionally, we expect the bill to present numerous issues. These issues include the expected wide use of delegated powers and Henry VIII clauses, the balance, between, balance of power between ministers and parliament, how this reform interacts with the devolution settlement, and the ongoing status of the case law of the Court of Justice of the European Union. Thankfully, we have an excellent panel today who are going to share their insights on this bill and related matters. They are Professor Catherine Barnard, Professor of European Union Law and Employment Law at the University of Cambridge, Dr. Tom West, Delegated Legislation Review Manager at the Hansard Society, and Ruth Chambers, a Senior Parliamentary Affairs Associate at Greener UK. Each of our speakers will speak for around eight to 10 minutes, and then we will move to a discussion and then on to a Q&A. If you have any questions that you would like to put to the panel, please write in the Q&A function, not the chat function, that Lisa, our excellent Q&A facilitator, will select a broad range of questions and put them to the panel at the end. We will ask people who've submitted questions to uh, join us on the screen and submit the, submit the question directly, to and pose the question directly. But if you'd rather not do that, please indicate that to Lisa in your message. The whole session, including the Q&A, is being recorded and will be posted online on the Constitution Unit website, the YouTube channel, and as a Constitution Unit podcast after the event. We will let you know when the recording is available, and we hope you might want to share it with others too. So. Let's get started. Catherine, over to you. Um, thank you very much indeed uh, for that kind introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm being given the task of just giving an overview of where we're at and um, perhaps indicating some of the things that I've heard in discussions about um, what might happen, or at least what might be um, coming down the line. Of course, all of this is subject to um, the, the outcome of the Tory leadership uh, competition or contest. So um, in the Queen's speech, as we know, um, the Queen made clear that uh, the uh, provisions on retained EU law in the EU Withdrawal Act 2018 um, were a bridging measure when we left EU, the EU to ensure short-term legal stability, but in the knowledge that much of it was not right for the UK in the longer term. So we already knew that um, we are going to get changes to what was in the 2018 Act. Just to uh, remind you all um, of what is in the 2018 Act so we can see what might be changed. So when we're talking about retained EU law, at least in the broad sense of the term, you've got um, retained EU law, um, which is both preserved and converted. I'll explain that in a moment. You've also got retained EU case law, which includes both the domestic case law interpreting EU law and also retained EU case law from the Court of Justice. And you've also got um, the general principles of law as well, although quite how they have been legally retained is more complex uh, to determine. Now, as far as retained EU law in the somewhat more narrow sense of the word, so this box, which distinguishes between preserved and con converted EU law, 
I just want to say a bit, a word or two more about that, because this is a bit of the legislation which is really rather complicated, but you just need to get your head around it to help understand what changes might be um, brought into play. So you've got uh, preserved um, or EU derived legislation. And first and foremost, that is any of the regulations which were made under the Section 2.2 powers of the European Community Act. So a good example of that would be the working time regulations implementing uh, the working time directive. Clearly, once the European Communities Act was turned off, those regulations would have fallen had they not been preserved by the 2018 Act. And that was the case for a huge swathes of legislation. But interestingly, and this is going to be a theme I'm going to talk about, um, preserved um, EU law also included preserving primary legislation and secondary legislation, which wasn't adopted under Section 2.2. So primary legislation, so first and foremost, to give you an example, would be the Equality Act 2010, uh, which gives, which implements um, a significant amount of EU um, equality law. And that was preserved presumably against potential challenges by lawyers saying, look, we've left the EU um, and therefore the Equality Act is no longer good law. That was stopped um, by um, the provisions in Section 6.7 and Section 1B.7. But also so was any secondary legislation adopted under other legal bases like provisions of the Health and Safety at Work Act. So that is in essence preserved legislation um, and then you've got converted legislation, and that was primarily things like EU regulations with a capital R. So EU regulations like the um, passenger rights, the regulation on giving you compensation um, if your plane is late, that was a regulation. So it didn't actually need to be implemented in the UK and therefore had to be converted into retained EU law uh, once um, we left the EU. And that's what you see uh, down this line. Uh, the same applied to EU decisions, um, which um, uh, might have legislative effect, and also EU, uh, what is described as tertiary legislation, but by that I mean delegated acts and implementing acts. And then the other major block that I'd want to say just something about is that what was also converted was directly effective provisions. First and foremost, treaty provisions, and a good example of that would be Article 157 TFEU on equal pay for men and women, and that was converted, as you can see, by Section 4. So that's a whistle-stop tour through what you find in the legislation at the moment, which brings us to the commitments in the Queen's speech and the a uh, fancy name of the Brexit Freedoms Bill. I suspect it won't be called that. It will be something like Retained EU Law Reform Bill, something along those lines, which follows the more standard model of naming of legislation. And what we know um, from the Queen's speech is that there were three proposals, creating new powers to strengthen the ability to amend or repeal that large body of retained EU law that I've just described, removing the supremacy of retained EU law, and thirdly, clarifying the status of retained EU law. Now, that's what the Queen's speech says. What we know in between times is that the government published a dashboard trying to identify all of uh, the retained EU law that was still left on the UK statute. But remember, quite a lot of it's been turned off um, either by Acts of Parliament. So, for example, Articles 45, on free movement of workers has been turned off um, by the immigration uh, legislation and other bits of retained EU law have been amended under the powers under the 2018 Act. But this is the government's um, best guess of what retained EU law is left and which government departments it sits under. Now, there is an oddity about all of this because I've tried to use this dashboard and I first looked up the working time regulations, which were always thought to be vulnerable to um, amendment right from the beginning. And this is the result you get for searching working time. And you get a sense of um, what um, has been unchanged and what hasn't. Personally, I don't find this um, uh, depiction of the working time regulations perhaps as helpful as it might be, you really need to know what you're looking for to try and understand this. 
But what's really striking is that I then typed in Equality Act and nothing came up, or almost nothing came up. And this seems to be um, part of a, a policy decision that Acts of Parliament, and remember Acts are um, brought under the heading of retained EU law, they're sitting over here, um, which was saved by section um, two. Acts of Parliament at the moment seem to be treated differently. Acts of Parliament uh, seem at the moment not to be subject to the potential um, turning off of retained EU law because they are um, constitutionally in our system um, at the top of the tree and therefore will not necessarily be affected uh, by any changes I'm going to mention. And this seems to be um, a change from Lord Frost to um, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob Rees-Mogg seems to be more sympathetic to the idea that um, the Acts of Parliament should only be changed by other Acts of Parliament, which perhaps explains why you can't find the Equality Act um, on the dashboard. Now, we already knew that Jacob Rees-Mogg um, was talking about um, having a sunset clause on all of retained EU law. And when I say all of retained EU law, I think what I'm talking about is non-Act of Parliament retained EU law. Um, and as you can see from this piece in The Guardian, a row had broken out whether this was really a good idea or not. And if you read the piece in some detail, it looks like Priti Patel herself had concerns about turning off so quickly all of retained EU law. Jacob Rees-Mogg's idea was to have a sunset clause for all of retained EU law um, of the 23rd of June 2026, i.e. 10 years after the Brexit vote. And so the way it appeared to have been left is that um, even though Jacob Rees-Mogg was keen to have a sunset clause for all of retained EU law, apart from Acts of Parliament, um, there was pushback from members of the cabinet. So what might happen? We've already seen that supremacy um, is um, in the firing line. Um, and uh, we certainly know that uh, first sight supremacy was turned off supremacy of eu law was turned off by the european by the um eu withdrawal at the 2018 act but then you remember in section 52 it was retained um uh, in respect of uh, retained eu law which um has been described variously as a constitutional novelty so one possibility is that maybe there's going to be a sunset clause on the supremacy principle now that um is fine as far as it goes, but then it does create all of the problems of uncertainty. To go back to the examples I've given you, what about um, Article 157 TFEU? What happens if the provisions in Article 157 conflict with the provisions in the Equality Act or the Equality Act conflicts with the provisions in Article 157? What um, prevails? Do you say that the Equality Act provisions now prevail because they're later in time than the Article 157, which has been there in the treaty since 1957? Or do you in fact say, well, look, um, the uh, Article 157 has been carried into UK law through um, uh, the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. The 2018 Act is later in time than the Equality Act 2010, and therefore Article 157 prevails. Or do you just dilute the language of supremacy and just talk about conflicts rules? It's a, it's a rule of conflicts and you need to work out uh, which rule prevails in which circumstances it might be possible for a department to go in that direction. We do know that they also want to uh, make it much easier to repeal um, uh, retained uh, EU law. I'm not going to say very much about this because this is what Tom is going to do. Um, it's thought that there might be about 800 pieces of retained direct EU law that needs to be um, uh, amended. Um, the question is, how will it be amended? What's the process? Uh, will there be just some sort of section 2-2 power um, uh, in reverse? So it just there's a sort of blanket provision that enables uh, this retained direct EU law to be turned off. Or will there be something more targeted? Will the usual consultation processes apply? Uh, will there be some sort of sifting process? I think these are the questions that um, Tom will address in more detail. If 
there is just a very wide power to turn off um, retained EU law, um, then uh, I think there'll be huge pressure from the Brexit Opportunities Unit on uh, government departments to come up with a plan as to how they are going to um, turn off all of that secondary legislation. Now, clearly going down that route will take longer than having a sunset clause of the whole corpus of retained EU law uh, in a way that Jacob Rees-Mogg had been proposing. And now we know that um, uh, Rishi Sunak has said he is going to turn off all of um, retained EU law um, before the uh, next election, which could be about 2024. And I'm told today that Liz Truss has said she's going to have it all turned off by next year. Now, this raises some really very important questions about how this might be delivered. Clearly, it will be very effective, but will it also apply to acts of parliament? It also presupposes that um, all EU law is of necessity a bad thing. I think most people on this call would agree that, for example, the Equality Act 2010, while far from perfect, embodies some really very important rights. Are we going to then re-legislate and have um, our own version of those rights? Is there the civil, civil service capacity to do that? There are also issues about um, divergence and how that's going to be managed, and also issues about how this might in, uh, interact with the level playing field provisions in the TCA. My final point is about the role of the Court of Justice. And as far as the Court of Justice is concerned, as you will recall in the original version of the Act, um, in respect of pre-Brexit case law, both of domestic courts and of the Court of Justice, that pre-Brexit case law um, uh, could only be reversed by a decision of the Supreme Court or equivalent. That was expanded um, to include the decisions of the, the giving the power to the Court of Appeal um, by a statutory instrument, which is on the slide. And, um, the, and this is the situation we're in at the moment. What is striking is the reluctance of the court so far to make um, radical change. And the best example of this is the tune-in decision, which I've referred to on the slide. Uh, where um, Lord Justice Arnold gave eight reasons why um, it was uh, not appropriate in this case to um, depart from retained EU case law. Now, this is clearly not um, compatible with the views of this government. And so what will be interesting to look out for is whether there will be more of a push in any legislation uh, to um, speed up the process by the judges to uh, depart from retained EU case law. And on that note, I will stop. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Catherine. That was an excellent introduction to the issues. Uh, Tom, over to you. Thank you, Joe, and thanks to the unit too for asking me to speak about this really important bill. Um, in our little practice room before, I referred to it as my favourite bill, although Joe did point out there's quite a few to choose from at the moment. So as, as Catherine said, I'm going to talk largely about parliamentary procedures and what the various options might be for the use of these powers under this bill, pros and cons of different options. Um, before I get into some of those nuts and bolts though, I do want to just give us sort of a bit more context as to where we're coming from. So the, the Hansard Society, we, we have for a number of years now been, been concerned and been raising the flag really about problems, both constitutional and practical problems with the use of delegated legislation. Um, in a nutshell, we think that statutory instruments too often receive too little scrutiny. And, and that's a problem because SIs, they're not just doing sort of administrative dotting of I's and crossing of T's, they do do that, but they can also at times be used to make quite important decisions. Um, and, and that sits alongside really a growing tendency that we're seeing of, of bills of primary legislation to come to Parliament with important decisions on policy yet to be made. And, and that leads to what the Lord's Delegated Powers Committee called skeleton bills. They sound rather terrifying, don't they? Well, they are a little bit because these, these are bills which have powers in them instead of policies. We don't know how those powers will be used. And that leaves those important decisions to secondary ledge, to the regs. Now, given that the UK has regained policymaking powers and responsibility in a number of areas following Brexit, I think we need to look carefully at where those policymaking powers are actually being exercised. Is it in the primary or is it in the secondary legislation? 
So lots of these issues are not unique to this bill. Um, that's why we're, we've got our delegated legislation review project, which is looking at these issues in the round uh, and looking to develop proposals to reform the system as a whole. Um, I'll say some more about that towards the end if I've got a bit of time. But, but, but back to this bill. And I think the first thing I want to say is that, of course, there's nothing inherently objectionable about the government seeking to and Parliament approving to change retained EU law now we've left the EU. But the, the question is, how should that be done? Um, and in particular for us, what degree of parliamentary scrutiny is appropriate for that? Um, now, of course, degrees of parliamentary scrutiny are just that. They are degrees. They exist on a spectrum and, and there are trade-offs to be made. Uh, often, normally, perhaps, these are between speed and depth of scrutiny. And that's true with bills as much as with delegated legislation. You know, how many bills have we seen recently which have been rushed through the houses fairly quickly? How many bills get pre legislative scrutiny? So there's trade-offs there as well. Um, and so I think the question here that I think it's necessary to focus on is what degree is appropriate for changes to retain EU law? Now, unfortunately, I think that's quite a hard question to answer in the abstract. Um, as Catherine has shown us, um, retained EU law is rather complicated, which is a nice understatement, I think, of the situation. But in, importantly, it's not, retained EU law, it's not a sort of flat or uniform body of law. It covers different policy areas, it contains sort of different orders of legal rules, high level principles up in the mountains and real detailed technical minutiae down in the weeds. So that means that we think it's quite unlikely that there's going to be a one size fits all approach, which would lead to appropriate scrutiny to these changes. It's just going to be too blunt. Um, of course, another important variable in all of this is that we haven't seen the powers. The bill hasn't been published yet, and that will be crucial. Will it be more like a reverse Section 2.2 power or, or will it take a different approach? Um, so what these powers allow in terms of the purpose or purposes for which retained EU law can be changed, um, their scope of application, will it be all retained EU law or will certain aspects, the particular sort of acts of parliament be excluded? Um, but also their duration, I think, is worth thinking about. Um, so uh, there's an important difference between sort of powers which are disposable or one-off they allow retained EU law to be changed up to an end point, to do things, to sort of do a one-off tweak, to make things fit the UK's context better, just to fine tune the engine. You can compare those to powers which allow retained EU law to be modified indefinitely. Uh, those could potentially allow uh, government to, to make new policy, make important changes in, in, indefinitely um, in a non-time limited way. That's not so much a tweak to the engine, but it's about buying a new car. Um, and of course, the thing we often talk about is if these powers are indefinite, one day there'll be a new minister, one day there'll be a new government, they might have different tastes, they might prefer a different car, and has Parliament really given approval to that? But, but none of this is really to say that retaining the EU law can never be appropriate to change retained EU law by SI. It, it, it can be. The issue is that not all changes to retained EU law will be of the same character. Um, and in particular for those more significant changes, uh, and I think it's fair to say that we can reasonably expect whoever makes up the new government, they are going to want to make some significant changes. They're going to want to make some high profile changes to retain the law. And for those, we think the existing standard scrutiny procedures for SI is simply not good enough. Um, this is something we have said and written a lot about in the past. Um, I do not propose to try and repeat it all again now, um, but just to give some of the headlines. Um, most SIs, as statutory instruments, are approved without debate or vote to be the House. That's the negative procedure. For those that are debated, in the Commons, that will usually take place in a temporary ad hoc delegated legislation committee. I think it's fair to say that those debates are normally rather cursory. Uh, MPs will have little time to prepare for them. They'll have no staff support or briefing from the clerks to help them understand. It can result in very limited information being available as to what these instruments are doing. And, and ultimately, in these committees, they're often there to simply wave, wave things through, and they'll often take less than half an hour. So they're not really seen as a great use of time. Um, uh, and that also results in a bit of a reputational risk within the House of Commons. Uh, things are a bit better in the Lords, and um, there's a number of reasons for that, but in particular, I think the existence of the House of Lords Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committee, and that this committee is tasked with looking at every SI, reporting on them, and, and drawing attention or raising interest of those which they think the attention of the House needs to be drawn to. So there's some substance, some analysis on which peers can base their debates. Um, but of course, there are problems with what the Lords can uh, and will do on the basis of that consideration. Um, and the final point, of course, is that SIs can't be amended. Um, but perhaps it is actually a bit unfair of me to be using the standard procedures as a starting point. 
Um, because last month, Jacob Rees-Mogg, and we've already heard how he might be some more sympathetic to some of the concerns being raised here, he, he wrote a letter to the Bayes Committee, the Business Select Committee, about this bill and raised the, the potential for use of legislative reform orders for those. And we had a blog about that quite this morning, so, so do take a read. Um, but to give you a summary, so in this letter, he said that there will be a strong case for the use of legislative reform orders with regards to retained EU law. The legislative reform order process may be a key tool in addressing retained EU law, and I hope that the committee would look upon that ambition favourably. So legislative reform orders, LROs, um, these are a form of delegated legislation that come with a bespoke and enhanced parliamentary procedure. They give quite a different starting point to think about. Um, the procedure was created by the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act 2006. Um, that created new powers to remove regulatory burdens. Um, those powers, that act, I think it's fair to say, was again pretty controversial at the time, um, which is why this bespoke procedure was created. Um, it does give a greater degree of control to Parliament. Um, in fact, it can probably be thought of as one of the highest forms of scrutiny for secondary legislation. So again, I mean, I don't want to get into all the minutiae, um, but what does the LRO process give us? Um, it has a, there's a requirement for consultation, um, and there's a substantial role for committees in each house. So the Delegated Powers Committee in the Lords uh, and the Bayes Committee in the Commons, uh, those committees can upgrade the scrutiny procedure. So essentially it's a form of SIFT, um, able to uh, change what the procedure is. And they also have an option to go for what's called the super affirmative procedure. Uh, and for those, um, the committees can also additionally report on the draft order and make recommendations to amend it. Now they can't amend it directly, um, but the minister must have regards to those reports. Uh, and the committees can, in any case, um, recommend that no further proceedings be taken. So effectively a veto. It can be overridden by resolution of the whole house, um, but that's a much stronger provision. Um, so the process overall, it's, it's more robust, more thorough. It, it puts more into the hands of Parliament. Um, Parliament can control the degree of scrutiny. It can do that as well on the basis of the actual instrument in front of it, rather than a sort of more um, theoretical or abstract discussion about what a power could in principle permit. And that's quite a big difference, I think. It's much more active, much more active role for Parliament. Um, also noteworthy that permanent, that specific, specific permanent select committee a task with looking at the instruments. If you compare that to what I said about DLCs, you've got staff support, or people with working relationships, but a focal point for scrutiny. Uh, and that's unusual, and I think it's, it's a benefit for better scrutiny. Flip side to all this, and this goes back to what I said about speed versus depth of scrutiny, LROs are relatively slow. They need more internal resource. They take longer to get through Parliament. Um, this government guidance and a post-legislative assessment, um, they're a few years old now, back from the hazy days from before Brexit, but they're quite clear that the degree of effort for them can be similar to that of a bill. And if a bill's available, that might be an easier option. So the LRO, press, LRO process might be a better starting point than the standard procedures, but it comes with costs. And it circles us back, I think, really, to this question about what's the best way to making changes to retain the new law in the time frame available. And that's a complex question. You've got to bear in mind the diversity of the law, the diversity of the changes, and the fact there could be really significant numbers of them. Um, there have been only 40 LRO, less than 40 LROs since 2006. Um, I just want to flag a few final points, um, which might be interesting discussion. The first thing about devolution, and, and to say that there could be some real important implications for the devolution agreements and how this uh, bill is drafted and how it functions. Secondly, there has been some talk um, in relation to this bill uh, around improving transparency about the pipeline of SIs coming to be laid before Parliament. Um, Mark Spencer gave evidence to two Lord scrutiny committees earlier this week, which might not be the case, but there's, there's a possibility for it. It'd be really good, I think, for Parliament and the public to have greater insights to what SIs are coming, and also some talk in relation to impact assessments and reconsideration of when the best time is to do those and how they can best inform parliamentary scrutiny. There's some real limitations and problems, I think, at the moment about, about current practice, so room for improvement there. Um, that's it from me for now. Uh, back to you, Joe. Thanks very much, Tom. Some really important questions there about parliamentary process around this bill. Uh, Ruth, over to you. Thanks ever so much, Joe. Um, nice to see everybody in a virtual sense. So I'm going to speak from an environmental perspective and try to add some practical insight um, on top of what you've heard from Tom and Catherine. Uh, I work for the Greener UK 
coalition of environmental NGOs, and we've been diligently and doggedly monitoring and seeking to influence the post-EU legal and policy landscape since 2017. We began this work in earnest then when we identified and campaigned to fill the environmental governance gap that arose when the UK left the EU. And at the heart of our work was a concerted effort to secure a legal basis for environmental principles such as the polluter must pay and an independent green watchdog. And that was eventually done through the 2021 Environment Act. But the heralding of the rule bill creates a strong sense of deja vu for us. Our first legislative foray was on the EU Withdrawal Act in 2018. And through that, we sought to instill environmental imperatives in the midst of much wider constitutional debates. And it feels like shortly we will be doing this again. So why are we bothered? Well, quite simply, because a huge amount of important technical environmental law is potentially at risk. And I'd like to illustrate our concern with five brief points. Firstly, environmental rule is both voluminous and complex. So as you can see from the rule dashboard that Catherine displayed earlier, um, that was published by the Cabinet Office earlier this summer, DEFRA, the Environment Department, has the greatest amount of rule at 570 pieces, even though some very important pieces, for example, on habitats protections, appear to have been omitted. What's in this long list? Well, just three brief examples. Uh, regulations that control the importation of animals due to the presence of monkeypox, for example. Regulations that protect and improve our water environment, including to ensure safe drinking water and regulations that control the marketing and use of pesticides. And all of these highlight, I think, that environmental rule in many cases also contains highly significant protections for human health. Secondly, there seems to be a risk of political dogma trumping a more common sense and pragmatic, pragmatic approach. And rule seems very much on the agenda of the two candidates to lead the next government. As we've heard from Catherine, both Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss want to turbocharge the rule review, pledging completion by the time of the next election and next year, respectively. Now, red tape challenges are definitely not new, of course, and have been a regular visitor to political agendas, but each one comes up with broadly the same conclusion. Most regulations improve lives and strengthen the economy and provide certainty to both the public and to businesses. Thirdly, the risk of unintended consequences seems especially high to us, including for the delivery of the government's high environmental ambitions. The government's pledge to leave the environment in a better state than it found it in the 25-year environment plan, and also to have the most ambitious environmental programme of any country on earth, and that's from the Conservative Manifesto. It has the tools it needs to deliver these commitments as the Environment Act provides a broad framework of duties, processes and powers, but these must be pursued with steadfast dedication over the next decade if they're to deliver meaningful environmental improvement. With the civil service facing severe headcount reductions, as we heard earlier, and the future size or shape of key environmental delivery bodies also coming under ministerial gaze, it does seem legitimate to pose the question, is there sufficient capacity to conduct the comprehensive and fundamental review that some are calling for without slowing or abandoning other government priorities? Fourthly, to build on what Tom's recently said, we can learn some lessons from our experience of how the huge batch of SIs that brought rule into our statute book was handled. Of course, we must reserve judgment until we know more about the process the government intends to follow. But as Tom highlighted, existing parliamentary scrutiny processes largely lack bite, unfortunately. SIs are rarely altered once laid. They're usually not published in draft form or subject to any prior engagement or consultation. And frankly, they are impenetrable to many given their technical nature. Our experience on the EU exit SIs shows that mistakes were inevitably made because of the pace and volume of drafting and laying, including some potentially serious ones. For example, the accidental deletion of a restriction on pesticides with endocrine disrupting prop properties that was spotted fortunately by academics at the University of Sussex. We are also troubled by that wider direction of travel that Tom described with a mushrooming framework bills and the growing use of delegated powers. 
but also the context and climate in which government ministers seem ever keener to evade parliamentary scrutiny, for example, by pulling out of select committee um, uh, sessions, such as the business secretary um, who did that at the 11th hour this week, or by systemic failures to allow parliament to do its job of scrutiny, um, most relevant on the uh, Australia trade deal, as we can also see this week. Fifthly and finally, and ending on a more hopeful note, fortunately, through rule, the government has a chance to clarify and improve how the law works to achieve its public policy objectives. But to do this, we believe it must move forward transparently, pragmatically, and with an open heart. In the course of our Brexit journey, our group of environmental NGOs have become adept at interpreting and suggesting ways to improve environmental law. With the arrival of the Office for Environmental Protection and its inbuilt unit of scrutiny experts, as well as learned friends on this call and in Parliament, the government will not want for sources of advice and expertise. And I hope the colleagues on the call from the Cabinet Office can convey this message to those steering its rule journey. Thanks, Joe. Back to you. Thanks very much, Ruth. Really, really important points there, particularly about how this is lots of issues here about constitutional and legislative process, but that downstream this is about reform to government and regulations and laws that affect businesses and society. Uh, so really important to, to join the dots on this. Um, remind us of the audience to please keep submitting questions for the Q&A, which we're about to move on to uh, shortly. Um, but just to kick off discussion, I'm going to start with a, a few questions for, for the panel. Um, so each of you referenced the ongoing leadership contest, and it seems, um, if reports are to believe, that uh, we're now in a sort of race for who can have the closest deadline, who can accelerate this process the most. I, I wondered if we could bring together um, our, our, the panel's thinking on what the implications of this emerging deadline race um, are. So does anybody want to take that one? I mean, I'm happy to kick off if, if that's OK, Joe. So, I mean, I think the deadline in the context in which it appears to be raised by the candidates seems to be a bit of a red herring because it's got the um, it's got the risk of forcing a review that the civil service doesn't frankly seem ready um, to have the capacity to do. Um, and when uh, when that happens, then, as I outlined in my remarks, uh, the risk of unintended consequences, bad drafting, uh, accidental mistakes seems really high. So uh, I would encourage the candidates to think very carefully about whether or not speed is the right way forward. And actually having a more measured and a more considered process would probably give them the sort of outcomes that they are, they are hoping for. Thanks, Ruth. Catherine? Jo, if I add to that, if I may, I mean, clearly having deadlines focuses minds, including, dare I say, academics' minds um, over having to deliver things. Um, and uh, the, 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 I can see from the government's point of view that the risk of not having a sort of deadline is that um, you continue to have all of this retained EU law on the statute book for really very many years to come. On the other hand, if you the field I know perhaps a bit more about, which is employment law, um, it's worth just remembering just how much of UK employment law is built on EU legislation. Now, working time is obviously the most controversial one, although interestingly, Kwasi Kwarteng um, uh, put a stop to any decision to turn off the working time regulations um, in January 2021. So clearly they recognise that there are benefits to the working time regulations and most people like in particular the four weeks now, 5.6 weeks paid annual leave. But there are other provisions which are much less um, visible, but um, which a lot of workers benefit from. Part time work uh, regulations, fixed term work regulations. I know the agency work regulations are much more controversial, but also remember um, all of the 20 odd um, health and safety directives, which have all been implemented into the UK. Um, which range from um, you know, matters like PPE, which of course became really serious issues. Now, the question is, what's going to happen with that, all of that legislation if it's literally going to be just turned off overnight? Does that create a gap? Or um, uh, does it mean that a British version of those rules will be adopted? And if it's a British version of those rules, will they be very different to what was in the EU directors in the first place? Because 
it must be said there is a sort of sense that anything that's come from the EU is of necessity bad law. But in fact, we all know that a lot of EU legislation has been very carefully um, looked at and negotiated. And the question is, do we just deregulate, just turn all of this stuff off, or do we come up with our own version? And then the, the uncertainty for business um, that has to now apply the British version of the EU rules on, say, part-time work or, say, fixed-term work um, creates a huge added cost, the very thing that the government is advocating that um, it wants to avoid. So um, it may be speed um, is the enemy of the good. Thanks so much, Catherine. Tom, do you want to come in this? Yeah, just to add to that, I mean, again, I do see the attraction, the political attraction of the deadline of wanting to make this not just be a sort of everlasting and never-ending process, but I think it's also interesting to see that in, in response to, to, to Rishi Sunak's sort of claim to try and accelerate this process further, the response to that was it was a leaked letter coming out from his time in the Treasury, sort of saying, well, hang on, there's so much to do here for, for tax retained EU law, I think we should be talking about and saying it's going to be very complicated, it's going to be very difficult. And of course, Ruth explained how that's true for environmental law, Catherine has for employment law. I'm, you know, I'm sure there's many areas of retained EU law where they go, well, actually, it might be politically attractive, but this is really complicated. And, and if we do this in a rushed way or get it wrong, those unintended consequences Ruth was talking about. Uh, and I think there are risks of cliff edges. We had quite a few cliff edges during the, the Brexit process. So we can see how while they might concentrate minds, they can also lead to things being rushed, the risks of legal vacuums that might be fallen into, and that problem was there. I mean, the, the flip side to all this as well, of course, is that if there's an, an end to the process, then that would presumably put a sunset on the powers to amend the law as well. And that goes to like what I was saying around, you know, there's a big difference between powers which are about sort of a one-off, um, tweak the engine, get things, you know, how they should be, um, versus sort of transferring those policy-making responsibilities and powers which have um, been regained from the EU uh, into being done via delegated legislation um, indefinitely. Um, and then also there's the capacity issue as well, of course, and thinking about, well, that these changes, obviously, they're going to be significant, they're going to need a lot of work and a lot of effort, um, how you get that balance right will not be straightforward and may also vary between different departments. Thanks, Tom. I guess I guess a related question on this is, is the um, preparedness of the different departments um, to actually do this work. So obviously the bill will, uh, we expect, provide them with various powers uh, to amend uh, retained EU law. But um, does anybody have any insight on how prepared the departments themselves are to actually do this substantive reform work? Are there agendas in place ready to go? Or is this something that will take many years from this point? My, sorry, I was going to say, my understanding is that some departments are more on top of it than others. Um, some departments um, uh, obviously have a much bigger job than others, as Ruth was saying. I mean, DEFRA being a case in point, I mean, its, it's um, uh, exposure runs to the hundreds, whereas other departments are um, in the low tens. Um, it's clearly um, government policy, and therefore all departments are on alert to the fact that uh, changes have got to be made. Um, but of course, for the big departments, they're also having to introduce other major legislation um, to replace what uh, previously was done by the EU, of which, of course, DEFRA is again a good example. Um, and so, uh, you know, there is um, stretch at a time when also the departments are, are trying to arrange or trying to think through what a 20% cut in staff looks like. And of course, with all of the uncertainty generated around jobs, you can see that um, uh, there might be uh, some civil service might some, some civil servants might be somewhat distracted because they don't know if they've got a job um, in an, a, a, at the end of you know the next couple of months. It's, uh, so there are quite a lot of moving parts and you can see why it's putting quite a lot of pressure on civil servants. Does anybody else want to come in on that point, Ruth? Yeah, to, just to add to that. So, I mean, this obviously wasn't in departmental plans when they were made, because this is a relatively new sort of initiative. So, so that's one factor. Um, I think how prepared departments are will depend on the factors that Catherine outlined, but also um, exactly what approach is agreed collectively across government. Is this going to be a forensic fundamental look at every single um, piece of rule in that table? Or are departments going to be given more leeway and more freedom to pick and choose 
those priority areas of rule, which they um, believe or perceive to be in most need of review. And I think that will, you know, that will really speak to how prepared departments are. Um, also how it relates to other priorities, priorities that are already in train, um, priorities that are, you know, not yet delivered in the manifesto, and priorities that are yet to come in the enormous Queen's speech, which had, you know, 37 or 38 bills in it. So there's an awful lot of government business to deliver, let, let alone the kind of the rural initiative. And then fi a final point is, um, even if, you know, that the civil service teams and the departments are able and capable and find the capacity to take this forward, at what cost? Because if there isn't the engagement with the public or with academics or with, you know, businesses and all of the other interested stakeholder groups, and there isn't the transparency that allows us to engage, um, then I think the process will be kind of poorer for it. Thanks, Ruth. Tom, anything on that? Yeah, I'll just add quickly on that. I mean, the first thing I'd say is what Ruth was saying is, well, what will be the process and the mechanism as well when a department decides it wants to keep EU law? You know, will there be a sort of formal process, a legislative one, an administrative one by the dashboard? What will it be when the answer is, yeah, actually, this, this is fine, this fits our needs, this works? Um, that's, that's an open question. And, and the other point on this, on the fact that there's other major legislation going through, we're going back again to the lessons learned from the LRO process, which said, well, actually, if there is another bill which this could be part of you know that's often uh, an easier or a neater uh, solution so there may be opportunities for that and, and in fact we already have seen a number of sector specific bills which have been either amending re retaining the law directly or taking powers to do so now everything that you know we've all said around that use of powers to make important decisions and proper parliamentary scrutiny being needed that applies um but what the one, one advantage of that approach is, is obviously you can have much more sort of specific, the defined uh, and drafted powers, because they could be more close to the actual sort of the policy intent and the policy goals within that particular policy area, as opposed to, you know, what we can expect might be quite vague and general and open powers, which apply more generally um, in, in this proposed bill. Um, so, I, you know, there's not going to be, I was talking about there's not a one size fits all, well, it's not like this bill is going to provide the only way in which retained EU law is changed in the future. There's going to be you know, a, a full range of different approaches which are available, um, no matter what this bill does. Thanks, Tom. Um, just one more question from me before we throw over to the Q&A um, section of the session. Um, a few of you have mentioned devolution, the implications of this bill for devolution. Um, can somebody sort of explain what those implications might be? Um, I know it's an exercise in speculation, but what are the potential implications for the devolution settlement here? I'll, I'll have a go at the first speculation, if that's right. <laughs> so I suppose there's two sort of ways that the bill could approach. One is that it could create powers for UK ministers uh, to amend uh, law in areas which are a devolved competences. Um, and that may come with some degree of uh, involvement or engagement with the devolved institutions. But either way, those have been controversial over the last few years. And the mechanisms for engaging the devolved institutions, whether those are the executives or the legislatures in those, there's no sort of standard process. And they sometimes leave, um, I suppose, uh, some things wanting in terms of uh, the timing, at what point um, devolved institutions and legislatures can be involved in that. Um, and of course, there's also the quite big constitutional questions about the appropriateness of that. And that also goes as well to what I've been saying about, well, that might be fine today, but what about tomorrow? What about next year? What about in five years' time? So it's okay for you know you to use this power to do this sort of uncontroversial thing, but with that power still lying on a statute book, um, it might be problematic. Um, uh, well, an alternative is it doesn't have though, you know, and, and the powers for the UK um, ministers do, do not extend that far. Um, but then you open up big questions around internal market acts and common frameworks and, and how those processes are going to be engaged if the UK is seeking to change retained EU laws, which engages um, with those processes. And, and, and what if there's failure to find agreement? Um, and so how all that will pan out and how will that will work out? I mean, you can really think, see the, the, the possibility or the scope um, for some quite big arguments coming down the line about how exactly these sometimes potentially quite technical decisions um, might be implemented and, and sort of the consequences and, and implications of that. Thanks so much, Tom. Does anybody else want to pick up on that, Ruth? 
three very practical um, uh, impacts, if you like, that I think we can foresee coming. One is this will inevitably, as an exercise, increase the potential for intra-UK policy disparity or divergence. I think that's probably inevitable. Um, another is that it will make um, understanding our kind of legal rule book even more difficult for citizens of the UK, depending on where you live. It's already almost impossible to do that. But, you know, it, once this exercise starts to unfold, I think it'll be even more challenging. Uh, and then a final one is it will inevitably have knock on capacity impacts on the devolved legislators ability to pursue their own legislative programs. We're already seeing that in Wales, for example, where the Welsh Government um, brought forward only five bills in early July as part of its legislative programme. It's yet to um, bring forward legislation to do um, an equivalent job that the UK government's done on things like setting up an office for environmental protection. And one of the reasons it cites for that is the lack of capacity. And one of the reasons for that lack of capacity, it is having to engage itself in lots of legislation that the UK government is making that has knock on implications for devolution issues. And I think the, the rural project will just add to the devolved government's workload in that regard. Thanks very much, Ruth. Catherine, anything to add on this? Yeah, I think the the, the real crunch issue, which um, has not been mentioned so far, is, of course, Northern Ireland. Um, and um, so we know the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill turns off um, a large chunk of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, and, of course, quite the implications of this for the North-South border um, is um, a serious issue, because if uh, the consequence of that is that there's no obligation on uh, dynamic alignment, then does that mean that Northern Ireland just remains subject to um, the law of the United Kingdom? Um, and then, of course, that makes it all the more likely that there will be checks. Now, the question is, where are the checks going to take place? Are they going to be North-South checks, which, of course, is de facto um, against the Good Friday Agreement? Or are we actually see, going to see more checks, um, in fact, uh, uh, between Ireland and France, um, um, which um, is I'm I begin to I'm hearing is what's beginning to happen. So there are serious implications there. Now there's a question in the Q and A, which I think is a very well made point. The bit of the Northern Ireland Protocol which has not been turned off is Article Two, which is on um, at a minimum um, equality rights, um, but lots of people argue it goes further further than that and extends to um, protection of uh, wider social policy uh, which would include a number of the directives and thus the regulations that i've been talking about so presumably for all the talk about turning off retained eu law uh, in fact um, it may well be that in respect of northern ireland the rump of the northern ireland protocol uh, means that, um, that at least that legislation, that EU legislation will continue applying in Northern Ireland. So there'll already be divergence. The one other point I wanted to make just on um, divergence is, of course, um, in respect of technical legislation um, on the rules concerning widgets in headlights, um, which are part of a, um, which are supplied into the EU market. Um, there are two issues there. If you're going to turn off all of this retained EU law on technical standards, what does this mean for manufacturers? Will they still be able to manufacture in accordance with EU rules if they sell predominantly into the EU market? And secondly, um, even if they decide not to turn off those rules, there is still a, a very practical problem about dynamic alignment in respect of GB, in respect of technical standards, which will be changing. And of course, um, I realize this is very unpalatable observation because we're talking about turning off retained EU law, not, uh, but there is a still no express power, um, express general power at least, um, to have any form of uh, alignment uh, going forward. Um, there's no equivalent of section 2.2 to keep UK up, law up to date. Now, of course, I know the answer to that, which is, um, well, we've left the EU, we, of course, we don't need to follow EU rules, but of course, that, it might look rather different if you're manufacturing widgets um, in Sunderland. Thanks, Catherine. Um, at this point, we go through over to Lisa, our Q&A facilitator, who's got some questions lined up, I understand. How much it's possible to get through a Zoom session without something going wrong with the Zoom? Joe, would, would it help if we um, perhaps looked at the Q&A and just tackled one or two of the questions which are directed perhaps most closely at us? <laughs> 
Yeah, let's start by doing that. There's an interesting question here about nudging the court of uh, nudging the judges to um, depart more enthusiastically from. Yeah. Let's start judges. with that one, then we can pass back to Lisa. I think we yeah. have our <laughs> Um So on that one, it really is an interesting point, isn't it? Because um, we know that um, the power to depart um, is used. It uses the test um, that the Supreme Court um, applies when departing from its own earlier authority. And in, in a, a system based on doctrine of precedent, you can see a lack of enthusiasm for making radical departures um, uh, because uh, it does undermine the coherence of the system. So in answer to um, the anonymous question, I think um, it, it will be, dare I say, it, more of a political statement than it actually will have a lot of um, legal impact, not least because, of course, um, Judges are quite wary of being told what to do by Parliament in in doing the judicial function. Of course, they comply with parliamentary rules and in, in other matters. So, I suspect uh, it will be less powerful than perhaps the uh, government might like. Thanks, Catherine. Does anybody else have anything to add on that question about the nudge around or the potential nudge around the European Court case law? No. Lisa, have you found your voice? I have, yes, sorry about that. Um, so we've, we've had some really interesting questions coming in from the audience, um, and I thought um, it would be a good idea to start with a couple which um, pick up the, uh, the topic of scrutiny um, and put it also in slightly broader context. So we'll start with Robin Taylor um, and then go to a question from Leon Lawrence Smith, um, who's a senior clerk in the Commons. Robin, do you want to put your questions to the panel? Shall I move on to Leon? Liam, can you hear? I can hear you very clearly. Excellent. I don't know whether you can hear me. I can hear you. Go ahead with your question. I was really impressed in Tom's blog today about the legislative reform orders and this huge amount of work that looks like it'll have to be done. And I just wanted to sort of a bit optimistically say that one of the great things about the legislative reform order process compared to the more adversarial bill process or delegated legislation committee process is that taking a select committee approach means there's much more opportunity for government backbenchers to engage constructively in scrutiny and when we get beyond the sort of Brexit remain dynamic and address the kind of issues that Catherine's been raising about how do things work in practice if you are trying to uh, run an enterprise or a business or whatever it is I think there's something of an upside in potentially on the parliamentary side of a greater constructive role for government backbenchers who are often out of the picture in legislation they turn up and shut up and sit behind the minister thanks Liam. tom do you want to respond to that anybody else yeah i mean i'd agree and i'd agree about being optimistic as well about these things but i think this the key word is constructive isn't it it's how to get constructive engagement in these, and, and I think often what you see in the Dell Ledge committees is it doesn't lend itself very well to those kind of constructive engagements and, and debates. And particularly where it is these technical issues, I mean, as we said often, it's pretty hard to get your head around what an SI is doing when you look at the at the text of it. And that was true in Brexit, but true in COVID as well. And so the, the, the sort of getting think about what the right format and what the right support is. Um, so that parliamentarians and MPs in particular are able to focus on the important issues. There's a lot of stuff which is done through, through SI, which isn't of much interest. It's technical, it's uncontroversial, but where it's those policy questions and getting into actually examining whether or not that's going to make sense, whether it's well evidence and so on and so forth, those are sort of questions where I think there'd be real opportunities to, to, to benefit on. Um, so it's not about sort of the, the big grand political fights. It's not the right forum for that either. It, it's about Parliament being able to, um, to to hold the executive to account and to make sure that what it's doing through these regs um, is is within the powers uh, and is um, going to achieve what the what those goals are. Um, so so yeah, I think that sort of goal around how to think about how to have constructive engagement is really key. Thanks, Tom. Ruth. Did you want to come in on this point as well? Yeah, just very briefly, and you know, Liam makes an excellent point about you know the I, I suppose the limited effectiveness of government backbenches in the scrutiny process for obvious reasons such as um, wh whipping and everything else. And you know, we've got direct experience of that in 
delegated legislation committees, but also on public bill committees too. So anything that can free them from those sort of constraints would I think be really helpful because you know what whatever party's in government then there is a, a pool of talents that could be deployed much more effectively than currently many are allowed to be. Um, there are fragments of good in the current SI scrutiny process but they are you know few and far between and I think whatever system or process the government is wondering about um, deploying for, for the new setup, then learning where those fragments of good are, as Tom outlined, the secondary legislation scrut scrutiny committee really stands out as being one of those, then I think that would be helpful. And finally, on legislative reform orders, most NGOs, most members of civil society have never heard of them, never had any experience of them. They sound really good in practice, but if they are to become deployed uh, more widely, then I think there will need to be some significant upskilling and learning as to how they work in practice, um, but both in Parliament, but also in kind of wider society as well. And we'd certainly love to learn more about them. Thanks, Ruth. Catherine, do you want to come in quickly on this question or should we move to the next one? Move to the next one. Lisa, we have another question, please. Yes, um, so I'm going to give a couple of questions um, and I will read out Robin's question um, since we, we don't seem to manage to connect. Um, Robin asks, if the trend towards skeleton bills and secondary legislation has been noticed for many decades, does this indicate a problem with the permanent government? So a question I think about you know, how far um, the issues we're discussing today are specific to this topic and how far we should see them as part of a longer running set of trends. Um, and then a couple of questions um, specifically about retained EU law. Um, we'll come to Michael Veal in a moment uh, to read his question, but first one from an anonymous attendee who asks, um, do we know whether direct principle retained EU law, things like the GDPR, um, are going to be treated in the same way as delegated or implementing acts in the sense of being converted to the status of secondary legislation? Should we expect that major legislative acts are going to be susceptible to amendment by SI um, much like you know, what we might have previously considered less major acts. Um, and then Michael, over to you. Hi, hi everyone, thanks. Um, so my question is about uh, retained case law and the role of the charter in retained case law. Um, there's some case law, European case law, that's a pretty big thorn in the side of, of the government. And I cited in the question, some of the data retention case law in particular, Privacy International, Tele2 and Watson, La Quadrature de Net, all, um, interact with national security and particularly practices in the UK. There was some talk in earlier days of explicit um, repeal of certain European judgments. Um, what's interesting about those is that, that as far as I understand it, and I'm not an expert in this, the EU withdrawal act sort of allows the charter to sort of still exist or still exist in correspondence to other domestic fundamental rights through that case law. And I'm wondering if there's been developments on or the panel feel that that's an area which um, uh, which may have interesting intera or unforeseen interactions um, in the future. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. We've got a few questions there for the panel to pick and choose from. So who's going to see you go first? Do you, do you want me to go first? Well, it's, it's in, in my head because uh, I think oh, some okay. of them are targeted at me and I'll have forgotten. Yeah. I've tried to write it down. Oh, thank you, Michael. On that, on that last point, um, yes, you're absolutely right. The, the Charter was expressly um, turned off. It was expressly excluded from that um, snapshot approach that was taken by the EU Withdrawal Act 2018. Um, but there was a sort of sleight of hand because um, what you see in the Act is uh, where reference is made to, a charter, to the Charter, it's a reference to general principles of law. And what's interesting about these general principles of law um, is for all the talk about turning off retained EU law, does that include turning off retained general principles of law? Now, I realize this is a question for nerds, but it actually has a direct impact on what you're talking about, because it, it's not clear to me, and I fully accept that newspaper headlines are not going to get into the weeds of this, but when we're talking about retained EU law, are we talking about retained EU law in the, in the general sense? My very first slide when I said retained EU law covers both the legislation side, but also um, the case law and the general principles, or is it just in the narrower sense when we're looking at converted and preserved? Now, the problem is, um, if, they've if they turn off the general principles of two, what does that mean for British courts um, looking at previous uh, decisions of the Court of Justice? Um, 
there was a decision of the Supreme Court that was handed down yesterday, which I'm afraid I haven't read apart from um, uh, just the headlines on, um, which uh, I, but I was struck where I saw the Supreme Court saying that the approach taken, this is in a case about how to determine um, pay, um, the approach taken by the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said was um, wholly consistent with the approach taken by the Court of Justice. Um, and the approach taken by the Court of Justice, particularly in the field of working time, is heavily influenced by the Charter. Um, and thus, um, all of this um, suggests that there will be considerable uncertainty going forward uh, if, if general principles are turned off too. On the other hand, British courts are used to looking at, um, at cases from other jurisdictions and give, using them to steer their interpretation or to give um, guidance. So perhaps it might not be as serious as would first appear. On the point about GDPR itself, will big bits of EU legislation, of which I think GDPR is pr um, probably the best example, will that they also be downgraded in the same way um, as other bits of legislation? I'm hearing not, um, and because of course they, the, the interconnection with the GDPR and the new uh, legislation on uh, data protection, I think GDPR might be um, treated separately. Thanks, Catherine. Does anybody else want to pick up any of the other questions, Tom? Thanks, Joe. Yeah, so on that question on the trend, I mean, absolutely, this is a long running trend. It's not just a problem sort of from now. I mean, the legislative and regulatory reform act of 2006 having very wide powers, people call it the abolition of parliament bill. Um, certainly, you know, use of powers, uh, the financial crisis in 2008, and all sorts of examples you can go back to as being an issue. Um, the problem you can see is that it's ministers, once they're no longer in power, then they'll sort of come clean and say, oh, actually, there is a bit of an issue around this. I mean, uh, Theresa May, you know, the other, we gave a, a lecture um, at the IFG where, where she talked about this you know, growing impact and, and, and the increased use of, of secondary education. So, of course, it's very difficult when you have to want to give up these, these very convenient ways of making law through secondary legislation. Um, but it is an issue. Um, Brexit and COVID have, on the one hand, they have really, I think, raised the profile of the problem and really demonstrated just how much can be done through the powers that are on the statute book uh, and just how quickly that can happen and just how significant some of those changes are. But on the other hand, you know, th these issues are by no means exclusive to Brexit and COVID. Um, that's what our delegated legislation review project is looking at. We think there's a need for a reset of the whole system of, of what these powers should be able to be used for in the first place and then how they're scrutinised. And we are in the middle of developing proposals for, for that reset um, of, of the system um, as a whole. Um, and, and if I can sort of tackle that question as well, a little bit around the different kinds of, of retained direct EU law, um, I think it, it's possible reading the room slightly around this, um, uh, what it will mean to change the status of retained EU law. But certainly a lot of those provisions in the Withdrawal Act, which seek to sort of carefully distinguish between different kinds of retained EU law, yes, they may well be lost. Now, they are, I think, um, Alison Young described as migraine inducing. They are hard to read, they are complicated, but you know, sometimes things are complicated and they were based on some sort of rationale to try to distinguish between these different types of retained EU law. And so it goes to what I've been saying, you know, I've been saying around how not all retained EU law is the same and not all changes to retained EU law are the same. And, and those which are technical, uncontroversial, you know, there should be able to do that in a relatively straightforward way, which doesn't involve um, sort of huge amounts of parliamentary time and effort, it's the ones which are making important changes, which are going to affect people's lives, which are going to affect how business op businesses operate. Those are the ones which we need to make sure don't get sort of uh, lost, lost among them all. You know, it's, you know, making sure we're able to find sort of the diamonds in the rough and so on. Thanks, Tom. Ruth? Just very briefly, again, on, on the same um, theme of how long has this sort of trend towards framework bills been going, a long time on in, on environmental legislation, and I've worked on environmental legislation for over 20 years. Just to give one practical example, it used to be that when governments would state on the face of the bill consultation requirements that would be quite explicit, well, the minister should consult this sort of person or this sort of group before taking a power forward. 
now that rather more standard construction is something like, and the minister shall consult whoever they think that they need to in taking this power forward. So a really kind of simple example. Obviously, that has consequences. It means that, you know, bills often lack that future proofing ed edge, as Tom described. Um, and it doesn't matter how many times you have that conversation with ministers when they're passing legislation, it doesn't quite register that they will come at some point in the future when they'll be on the receiving rather than the giving end of those powers. It's also got huge implications for the public as well, and because it means that once a bill is passed, the public businesses, civil society organisations really need to stay the course and engage in the consultation, try and engage with the secondary legislation, because it isn't enough just to kind of work on the bill. There's so much that will now come after it once it's passed. Thanks, Ruth. Lisa, I think we can squeeze in one or two more questions before we wrap up. Okay, great. Well, in that case, we're going to uh, finish with a couple of questions that pick up topics that we've touched on already in a, in a little bit more detail. Uh, so first, we'll go to David Henry uh, to ask a question about Scotland, uh, and then to Joe Derming for a question about the impacts of regulatory divergence. Hello, thank you very much. Um, watching this from Edinburgh is most interesting. Um, up here, we're having a very strong debate on that Scotland now has a written constitution and has had for a very long time, the claim of right, which has been reaffirmed in the House of Commons many times as well. I wondered with um, the EU Brexit situation and this proposed bill, if it isn't actually going to uh, be in com direct conflict with the claim of right and the rights that are embedded in that piece of legislation, it seems to be very little known. Um, and therefore would cause a constitutional crisis and if effectively bring an end to the Treaty of Union. Thanks, David. Joe, can we have your question? My question is, um, is simpler, really. It's um, about the scope for regulatory divergence to create increased costs for um, for um, businesses which trade either in, um, Catherine me mentioned widgets, um, but um, also in services um, with the EU. It seems to me that that, that, um, that the more diversions, the, the more um, trade will be, will be subject to costs. Thanks, Joe. So the panel has a choice between constitutional crisis or <laughs> complexity of regulatory divergence. And we, we're coming up to time, so if we can keep answers short. Um, Ruth, can I start with you? I'll leave the constitutional crisis for, for others. Um, on, on the regulatory divergence point and business costs that Joe raises, uh, absolutely. And I think to illustrate it with one very simple and brief example, um, that's UK reach and EU reach and chemicals governance and regulation. It's very um, straightforward to understand why the chemicals industry was arguing very strongly alongside stakeholders for the UK to remain part of EU reach or at the very least for there to be continued a very close alignment. Um, yes, that's to ensure continued regulation meets high standards, but it's also to minimise the cost on business. So there's one example of what you're talking about, Joe. Thanks, Ruth. Thanks, Ruth. Tom? I'll pass on the constitutional hot potato too, I'm afraid, but on, on the divergence point, um, what I'd say, just to remind that there's not just um, there's no longer the EU law obligations, there's also other international law obligations of the UK in many areas, and in many places retained EU law may well have been implementing wider international standards, uh, and many of those will, will still apply. So uh, the UK will need to think carefully uh, about what its international law obligations are, um, when seeking to change the change EU law. The, the, the TCA and the protocol are obvious examples of that, but by no means um, the only examples of international law which might be relevant. Thanks, Tom. Catherine, a final word from you? I'm afraid, David, I can't give you um, a deep insight into the claim of right, um, but what I um, know um, more about, um, which is um, one, of course, you've got the uh, Continuity Act where um, the uh, Scottish Government has taken the view that you want to stay aligned with or it wants to stay aligned with EU law. Um, and uh, of course, that's, that's got implications under the operation of the Internal Market Act, um, where, um, to put it crudely, if um, England um, decides to uh, 
lower its standards, deregulate uh, English goods will be capable of being sold in Scotland. Scottish goods will carry the higher costs uh, from uh, the legislation and those goods would have to be admitted to the Scottish market. Um, and uh, I, I think the um, at the moment, it's a rather sleeping dog, um, the Internal Market Act, for the simple reason that it's prospective. It's looking at future legislation. Uh, but I think it's there that you might find um, uh, some of your constitutional um, challenges and constitutional concerns being played out. But you, I'm afraid I don't have any insight on the claim of right, um, 1689. Thanks very much, Catherine. So we've reached the end of our time uh, today. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for the webinar and thank you very much to our excellent panel for all their um, contributions. Just a reminder that the recording will be available on the various platforms very soon. So please do uh, share it with people you, who may be interested. Um, and if you're not already signed up to the Constitution Unit's uh, excellent newsletter, please do make sure you sign up so you can get further information on future webinars. Um, thank you very much for joining us.